TorahCafe.com. I want you to see the next 45 minutes in this session as a crash course into what dreams are all about. From first a secular and historic perspective, a scientific perspective, and then from a Judaic perspective to get the full scope, the full picture. Sound like fun? Yes. Okay. So one of the most curious topics throughout all of human history since time immemorial is the interpretation, the nature, the purpose of dreams. And why do you think that that's the case? It's not surprising that that is the case because the average person spends 25 years of their life asleep. Think about it. The average person, the average age is 75. You sleep eight hours a night. That's 25 years of your life. Six years of that are spent dreaming. So it's no surprise that dreams have fascinated people since the beginning of time. Dreams, being that the content of dreams is so lifelike, philosophers have even questioned whether a person can know for sure that they're even awake. And this, this idea, there's, there's no real grounds that you can say that a person is, a, is awake. Think about in your dreams, you ever, ever have a very vivid dream where you're, where you're engaged in something and you can really smell the smells and taste the tastes and see the sights. You feel like you're really there. How do you know that the life that you're living in real life, that that's real life, and that your dream world is dream life? How do you know? Well, some of the philosophers throughout history have questioned this very idea. And this idea came really to a head in the East with a booklet called Zhuangzi Dream Tea Was a Butterfly. And in this booklet, in China, Zhuangzi was a philosopher, and he had this recurring dream. The recurring dream was he dreamt every single night that he was a butterfly, and after dreaming it for several nights in a row, he started questioning himself whether he was Zhuangzi, who just finished dreaming that he was a butterfly, or whether he's a butterfly that just began dreaming that he was Zhuangzi. And so philosophically, it's very difficult to even prove that you're awake. This idea also made its way to Western civilization as well with Rene Descartes, philosopher in Western civilization. And Rene Descartes had a very interesting premise based on this idea as well. He said, it's easier and it's more sensible to prove that God exists rather than proving that the world exists. He says, how can you really prove that the world exists? Just like a very deep and vivid dream, you, where you see the sights, and you smell the smells, and you hear the sounds, how do you know that in your waking life, it's not just your consciousness envisioning that there is a world around you? He said, there's no way to know. Could it be just your consciousness projecting this picture? But he said, the fact that you have consciousness, that consciousness had to come from somewhere. So Rene Descartes actually used this as an example that it's easier to prove that God exists than the world exists. This is how he used that idea of dreams. So works of dream interpretation have found themselves all throughout ancient cultures and early Sumerian texts. And one of the interesting things that you'll find is that the interpretation of dreams as we know it today really begins about 120 years ago with Sigmund Freud, Jewish by the way. Um, and 
with Sigmund Freud in his magnum opus on the interpretation of dreams. And in his work, he discusses dreams as everything in the dream containing meaning. Every bit, everything you encounter in your dreams has personal meaning to you. And interestingly enough, he considered himself a modern day Joseph, in a, Bible interp a, a dream interpreter, like Joseph in the Bible. And Freud claimed that every part of a person's dream has significance. And it's an expression of their innate desires and repressed feelings that they had throughout the day. Now, as we know, many of Freud's uh, perspectives have been overturned and disputed over the century, but the, his, his followers, uh, for example, Carl Jung, Alfred Adler, other psychologists throughout the 20th century have made similar stipulations. And what are some of the things that they say? What, what are the meanings of dreams? Well, one of the, one of the ideas is that a person has re repressed emotions that they experience throughout the day. And when you can't express it in the living world, in the, in the awake world, you express it in the dream world. So what does that look like? Let's say you're having a tough day at work and you really want to yell at your boss. And so you have all these emotions that you really want to express and you feel you need to express, but practically speaking, you know you can't because there might be some negative results that you don't like. So Carl Jung, for example, says that the dream world, dreams are a mechanism in which you can utilize, which you can express repressed emotions. So you would be able to yell at your boss in your dream without experiencing any sort of negative consequences. And then there are some in the, in the psychological world and in others that, that, that are studying dreams that say dreams are really relatively insignificant, that it's just a matter of taking your short-term memories and, and transferring them into your long-term memories. Just, it's a way like your brain is defragging, is filtering all of the thoughts and stimuli that you experience throughout the day. And the truth of the matter is, many of our dreams are actually, are actually like that. They're, they're an expression of what took place in our day, what's going on in our day, what emotionally we are uh, experiencing in our day, what sights and sounds we've seen throughout our day. There's a lot of times that we experience something in our day and we're not even aware of it. Every time we, we turn on our smartphones, we see an article, a picture, we don't even, a brain doesn't even consciously register that we're seeing that picture or that we're walking in the supermarket and we hear a song, we're not even realizing. You ever come to the end of the day and you have this song in your head, where, why is this song in my head? Like, little do you know, that, little did you know that when you were walking in the supermarket, that's what was playing in the background. So we're, we're constantly exposed to all sorts of stimuli throughout the day, and the dream world is sometimes a place where those incidents of the day come up. Now, one of the interesting things that you'll find uh, is that in history, there have been also creative and precognitive dreams. Meaning these are dreams that uh, either people came out with, uh, with ideas that they hadn't thought about until that point, or they um, dreamed about an event that took place only in the future. So Elias Howe, who is the inventor of the electric sewing machine, he came to the idea to invent the electric sewing machine in a dream. How did he come about? So he had this dream where he's being ch chased by cannibals. In the dream, he's being chased by cannibals. And what happens is they're chasing after him with, this, with these sticks. And the shape of the stick is what he used to be the model for the needle that he used for the electric sewing machine. So sometimes dreams can be an impetus for creative thinking. And then sometimes you have a dream about the future. Something hasn't happened yet, you dream about it very vividly, and then it comes about. One of the most famous incidents of this taking place is someone who looks Jewish, someone who's named Jewish, but someone who is not Jewish. I'm talking, of course, about our great president, Abraham, Lincoln. Lincoln, president during the Civil War, 
in the height of the Civil War, starts dreaming about his own assassination. In the dream, he's walking down the stairs from the east wing of the White House, and he sees a gathering of people gathered all around a coffin. And he goes over in his dream and asks someone in the crowd, why is everybody gathered here today? And one of the onlookers looked back at Mr. Lincoln and said, it's the president, he's been shot by an assassin. And he had this dream several times prior to what happened, the incident at Ford's Theater. One of the interesting things, by the way, is that his security guard, the night of Ford's Theater, warned him, with all these dreams and with things the way they are, maybe you shouldn't go to the theater that night. And the, 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 the security guard says to him as well that he, that he remembers that night that Mr. Lincoln said to him, goodbye, as opposed to his usual good night. Sort of spooky, right? So sometimes dreams do allude to something that can happen in the future. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not making the case that all dreams, and even, even this dream that Mr. Lincoln had, was a dream of prophetic value. Think about it. Just, you could just as easily say Mr. Lincoln was a, a president, which certainly is someone that is a, a tar target of assassinations, and not only president, but president in the most conflicted time in American history, the height of the Civil War. We know at least half the country wants him dead. And so to, to the idea of having a dream that he's assassinated during the Civil War, maybe, maybe it's prophetic in value, or maybe it's him channeling his emotions. Imagine the, the emotions that he was experiencing throughout the day could go either way. One of the interesting things that have that were studied over the course of the 20th century. There was a gentleman named Calvin Hall who studied dreams and their, the theme of dreams. Uh, he spent 50 years and, and went through about 50,000 people, interviewing people from all different backgrounds, uh, men and women uh, from all over the world, different ages, and he found something very interesting. He found that most people tend to dream about the same things, right? The people involved or the situation, the exact dynamic of the dream is different, but as far as what they're dreaming about, the concept of what they're dreaming about, it's basically the same things. Anyone know what the most popular dream in the world is? Close. 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 Those are all popular, all popular, being chased. The, big, the most popular and prominent dream in the world is that you're being chased. And you always realize in that dream, by the way, that you can never run really fast. You're always kind of running in slow motion. It's a weird thing. And so what modern dream interpreters say that this dream represents is a person being, in their waking life, having a feeling like they're being pursued. It could be by an individual, like their boss is pressuring them and chasing after them. It could be something that's going on in other relationships. It could be an idea, something's chasing after them that they're trying to get away from, that they don't want to be a part of. And that's how it expresses itself in the dream world. Another very popular dream uh, is, of course, the dream of falling, right? Falling, that you're falling from a high place or that you're drowning. And this, again, is a way in which your emotions throughout the day process themselves in your dreams at night. So modern dream interpreters will say something that, well, it's a reflection of what the emotions that are going on in your daily life. So if you feel like you're falling or you're drowning, Meaning like you feel like emotionally you're drowning, like you're overwhelmed in your, in your daily life. Whatever that, whatever that is in your particular life, that might express itself in the dream state. And so since these are all emotions that everyone experiences in one way or another, that that is put into a pattern by your brain and conveyed in the dream. And it's a way of sort of like alleviating some of that, some of that tension. Some of the other very popular dreams are where you uh, arrive at, uh, 
either at the airport or, uh, and you don't have your ticket or you don't have your license, you, f you, you feel like you're, uh, you, or you come late, you miss the train, you miss the bus, whatever it is. The, 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 again, these are, these are instances where you feel perhaps you missed an opportunity in your waking life. So we find a pattern that some of the most popular dreams are expressions that your brain can project of emotions that you're experiencing in your waking life. Another one I must mention, right, and then we'll move on to uh, the Judaic perspective. Another popular dream that you show up in public not fully dressed, right? Or underdressed. Either you're completely unclothed, and it's always kind of puzzling, how did you end up like that? But, uh, or you're dressed in pajamas. You're, you're, you're very either significantly underdressed or you're not dressed at all. And so this is an expression, modern dream interpreters will say that this is an expression of that perhaps in your waking life, you feel like you overexposed yourself emotionally. Maybe you shared something too personal with somebody that you kind of regretted. Like maybe I shouldn't have said something so personal, so deep, so exposing about myself. And again, that sort of shows itself in the dream world as overexposing yourself. And so dreams have, have a tremendous significance as well in our Jewish tradition. And I want to spend some time going through some of the ways in which Jewish perspective, Jewish, Jewish literature has addressed dreams. Because on the one hand, we see many instances in the Torah and in Jewish tradition where dreams carry significant meaning, even prophetic value, something given to us by the angels. Many times in the Torah text, you find dreams having significant meaning. And then other places in Jewish literature where dreams are just whatever happened during your day. They're kind of they kind of brushed aside as, as a result of the food that you ate or, the, or other instances that happened throughout the course of your day. So which one is it? Well, it's a little bit of both. The vast majority of our dreams today, especially, are dreams that are, that are expressions of something that was going on in our waking life, a song that we heard, a picture that we saw. Because we're so overexposed to different stimuli, the vast majority of the dreams that we have are something, we may not even be aware of it, that we, that we were exposed to that during the day, but it shows up in our dream somehow, somewhere. Rabbi Nachman of Breslov said something very interesting. He said there are two ways in which a dream expresses itself. Either it's an expression of the food that you ate or things that went on during the day, or it's from the angels. And he says it's interesting that the word Michael, food, and the word malach, angel, have the same letters, just rearranged. So it, he says he uses that as a, as a demonstrator of what the dream world is like. Either it's Michael, it's either it's like from the food you ate, meaning from outside, uh, outside influences, things in your, in your waking life, or it's from the Malachim, it's from the angels. And again, the vast majority of the, of the dreams that we have today are this, are, are this first type, where it's something that you had, something either that you saw during the day, that you heard during the day. We're so bombarded by stimuli, we don't even know, we're not even aware of it, that the dream state is an opportunity for it to just sort of defrag and process everything that we've encountered throughout our day. But let's, let's delve into the potential prophetic value that dreams can have as expressed in Jewish tradition. So one of the interesting places, one of the most interesting places that you see dreams carrying real significance is in the Torah text itself. We're given actually 10 times in the Torah text where different figures have dreams that have prophetic value to them. And so you, you find... Uh, obviously, the, you have Abraham, and you have Avimelech, and you have dreams where Jacob is dreaming with the ladder that goes into the, into the heavens with the angels going up and down. Joseph is known as Joseph the dreamer, and Joseph uh, uh, attains his status in Egypt 
by interpreting the dreams of Pharaoh. First, he interprets the dreams with, amongst his brothers, and then later on in his life, when he's in Egyptian prison, he becomes viceroy through interpreting Pharaoh's dreams. So we see certainly that there are instances, many instances, 10 in fact, in the Torah text, where dreams are given prophetic value. Now, something Kabbalistic to take note of in the Torah text is that in the Torah text, the root word for dream, chalom, the word for, the word for dream is chalom, so the root of that is ches lamed mem. In the Torah text, the root for the word dreams appears 48 times in the book of Genesis, and then another seven times throughout the rest of the Torah text. 48 times just in Genesis, and then seven times seven times in the rest of the five books of Moses. One of the interesting things the Talmud says is that there were 48 prophets and seven prophetesses. And so that correlation between dreams and prophecy is embedded in the Torah itself. One of the interesting things you'll find also is that when is it that we read these incidents of the dreams, these prophetic values that are given to dreams, with Joseph interpreting the dreams. What, what time of year do we read those? Well, all of the dreams that have significance are typically read in the month of Kislev, or December time, when the nights are the longest. The time of year when the nights are the longest, where you're dreaming the most. And so the, the emphasis, the idea that dreams carry prophetic value is very much embedded in our tradition. The Talmud mentions many times, in fact, towards the end of the tractate Brachos, there are pages and pages that are allocated just towards interpreting dreams. If you dream of a camel, this is what's going on. If you dream of X, Y, and Z thing, this is the meaning of it. Now again, because of our status today, being 2,000 years removed from that time, not only over-engaged and over-stimulated in so many ways, but also that our spiritual stature has declined significantly since Talmudic times, we can't necessarily open up a tractate brachot and say, oh, well, I dreamed about a camel last night, so this is exactly what, uh, and plus who dreams of camels these days anyway. But, um, but the idea is that dreams are, are given meaning and have meaning in our tradition. Another interesting thing that we find, the Talmud says that a dream that has not been interpreted is like a letter that hasn't been read. And Another fascinating idea along those lines is that a dream follows the interpretation of the mouth. Meaning, if a person dreams about something, it's not for good or for bad. The good or bad result that comes about from it is the way in which it's interpreted. So, there were some people who were hesitant in telling their enemies bad dreams that they have, lest they describe it or interpret it in a bad way, and then that bad way kind of comes into actual reality. And so dreams follow their interpretation. Dreams follow the mouth. And what's interesting is that in Hebrew, in numerology, in gematrias, the word chalom, dream, has the numeric value of 84. The word peh, mouth, has the numeric value of 85. So the dream it's followed by the mouth. First is the dream, then the mouth, the interpretation of, how, of what that dream means is how it actually comes into fruition. There were people, and this is, this is something that is halachically permissible, fasting for a bad dream. A person had a bad dream back in the day when dreams really, when people were at a higher level. A person dreamt a bad dream, they would fast in order that that dream wouldn't come into fruition. It's an amazing idea. In fact, there are two methods prescribed for someone who had a bad dream to avoid it coming out in a negative way. 
Number one was this formula that's in, if you look in the Sidurim, if you look in the prayer books that are a bit older, the modern ones don't, don't even have it anymore. But if you look for about 60 years ago, 70 years ago, there is a small passage for the amelioration of dreams, for the canceling of bad dreams. And so basically what it entailed is if somebody had, this, had a dream that was worrisome to them, they would gather a few of their friends. It was almost like Hataras Nadarim, annulling vows before we rush Hashanah, where you say, I've done, I, I've seen, I, I've had such and such a dream, it was bad, you don't have to go into the details, just that I dreamt a bad dream, and your three friends say, it should be good for you, it should be good for you, it should be good for you, and then it, it comes out good. You don't have to worry about that dream anymore. Another way, and this is something we can still do today, so I'm going to teach you a little trick, a little tool you can use. If you ever have a bad dream that really doesn't settle right for you and you want to get rid of it, any chance of it ever happening, anything bad ever happening from it. First of all, the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, says that in our generation, you don't have to be concerned about fasting for dreams or about, or about being too concerned about the dreams. But if you are, if it's really just gnawing at you and you're really concerned about it, I'm going to teach you the trick to get rid of it all. Any bad effect that could possibly come from it. It says that during the blessing of the Kohanim, during the blessing of the priests on the holidays, we, we outside the land of Israel only make the priestly blessing where the, where the Kohanim come to the front and they make the blessing on the Jewish people. We only do it during the holidays, but during that time is an auspicious time to cancel out any negative effects of dreams. And you ask yourself, why? In fact, if you look in the prayer book, during that, when the, when the Kohanim, when the priests are reciting that blessing, in the prayer book, the congregation is following along in a certain paragraph. What's the nature of the paragraph? If I've dreamed a dream that's damaging, let it be canceled. Right? Why would that be the time to get rid of bad dreams? Like, that's what we're reading about? That's what we're thinking about? Getting rid of bad dreams? Well, the Noyam Elimelech, Rabbi Elimelech of Lezhinsk, says something very interesting. Why that time? How is that during the, during the priestly blessing? Why is that the time to get rid of all the bad dreams? It says that when the priests, when the Kohanim are, are saying their blessing, they achieve a level that is akin to prophecy. It's, it's almost like for those few moments, they're on this prof, the level of prophet. And we have a principle in Judaism that the ratio of one in 60 annuls. So, for example, if a person has a, a pot of meat stew and accidentally a little drop of milk drops into the meat stew, don't try this at home, but technically speaking, if the ratio is 1 in 60, meaning there's 60 times as much meat in the meat stew than there is in the little drop of milk that fell in, the milk is annulled. It's canceled out because the ratio, the magic ratio, is 1 in 60. Now, the Talmud says that dreams are one-sixtieth of prophecy. And so during the time of the blessing of the Kohanim, during the time that the, the priests are up at the top blessing the Jewish people, and they are now conveying something that is akin to prophecy. So any dream that you might have had, and dreams are one-sixtieth of prophecy, is annulled in their presence. And so when you're standing there in front of the Kohanim, in front of the priests reciting their blessing, any potential negative effect that would have come from a dream is completely annulled. That's the magic. That's how it works. And if you are, if it's, it's, if it's, if it's in your kishkas, you're bothered by it, you're, a dream that you had, and you're really worried about something happening, first of all, you shouldn't be. But if you are, that's the way to get rid of it during that time. And outside the land of Israel, since we don't have that on a daily basis, just in the shul when the chazan, when the, when the one leading the, the prayers in the morning, when that person is saying, the, when, when that person says it in the Amidah, you can, you can have concentration during that time as well. There were people throughout the Middle Ages, great scholars and sages, who 
actually had what we call um, dream questions, a shyless chalom, a dream question. And these were people who prepared themselves in a very righteous way with certain rituals, and they would ask questions that they had in Torah study in the dream world to the angels. Again, this is something, don't try it at home. It's not, uh, this is not for, I'll speak for myself, not for me. Maybe someone in this room or many people in this room are on that level. It's not something I try at home. And he would ask not for the winning lottery numbers for that Friday night, but for places where they were stuck in their Torah study. And one of the, one of, we find an interesting volume called Chuvas Mina Shamayim, which means answers from heaven. And it goes over 70 answers that Rabbi Shlom, Rabbi um, Yaakov of Marvich obtained in the dream state. Answers that he got to old Talmudic debates. Very interesting. So what practically, what practically can we derive from our dreams today? We said that we're not necessarily on the caliber to experience the dream state in what it was originally intended or its ultimate well, there, there are several things that we can glean insight to today. One of the interesting things and di interesting differences that you find between the waking state and the dream state. In the waking state, everything runs according to order. Right? With nature, there's a, in fact, you would call it a, a timeline. Right? Where there's a past, a present, and a future. In the spiritual worlds, there's no time and there's no place. Place, space, time, th those, don't make, those, don't have any, those don't have any bearing in the spiritual worlds. In the dreams, as well, we find a similar thing. Where time and space don't really play any significance. In other words, there's no past, present, and future in your dream. When you get into a dream, there's a past already built in. You don't say like, hey, how'd I land up here? You just go with it. You just like, that's the starting point, and there's a whole past built in. And additionally, you can wake up in your dream world, in your current home, and walk outside, and it's your childhood home, and you can see people who are among the living and not among the living in your dream, or people that you haven't seen or spoken to in 20 years, and they just show up in your dream, and in your dream, you look at it like it's nothing. Like you almost expected them. Like, oh, hey, what are you doing here? And it's no big deal. Meanwhile, in your waking world, you haven't thought of this person in 20 years. You went to camp with them 20 years ago, or 40 years ago. And... And you just show up in your dream, and you're like, oh, just like it's a normal thing. So space doesn't make it, you wake up in your, in your, in your current house, you go outside in your, in your childhood home, everything, and everything is fine. Time, space doesn't make a difference. Among the living and not among the living, it's all the same. So a dream is a glimpse of what the spiritual worlds are like, where time and space is not doesn't hold that much. There's a very practical thing that we can glean from our dreams, and I'll take some questions. Being that a dream, aside from the high spiritual and prophetic value that dreams can possibly have, a practical thing that we still can learn from our dreams is sort of a spiritual assessment, an emotional assessment of things. Perhaps if you're dreaming or on a regular basis about a particular incident or about a particular thing uh, like we discussed in the beginning of this session where you're thinking uh, it's, a, it's one of these ways in which your emotions are processing themselves in your waking life. If you keep dreaming about something, it might be a good indicator to reflect in yourself about perhaps there's something in my waking life that needs correction. Maybe something I've been brushing aside for a long time, haven't dealt with. I'm not dealing with. I kind of just got used to it. But it keeps showing up in my dreams. This emotion that is being conveyed is something that 
I, I can't shake. I keep dreaming about it. I don't want to dream about it necessarily, but it keeps coming at me. Maybe that is a good indicator in your waking life of an area that you may want to address. Repressed memories, repressed emotions that maybe you had never thought to deal with, maybe you were afraid to confront, but if they're showing up in your dreams, it might be worth in your waking life addressing those. They can, be, they can still be a calibration of your emotional and spiritual life. Even if they're not from the angels and just a processing of your emotions, they still have spiritual value and significance that practically we can use even in our times. I'd like to close with a thought before we, before we spend some time, uh, about 10 minutes or so, taking questions. There was, there was an individual who asked the Rebbe, the Lubavitcher Rebbe, why did Hashem create us as creatures that need to sleep? What a waste of time. Why couldn't God, why couldn't God just create us as creatures that don't need sleep? We said at the beginning, right, if a person lives 75 years of the life and sleeps 8 hours a night, that's 25 years of life. Even half of that, 13 years, 12 years, 12 years, 12 and a half years of your life. What a waste of time. Why couldn't God just, like, just like he made food, we need food, right? Give us coffee, give us, give us more coffee, and we never have to sleep ever again. Why did God create us that when it's, an, it's natural, it's built into our system, especially in the nighttime, that when the sun goes down, so do we. We go down to sleep. Why does it work that way? Why did God do that? So the Rebbe answered something very interesting and very practical and real for the significance in our own life. The Rebbe said that without the idea of sleep to separate from day to day, there'd be no concept of tomorrow. So you ever have a day in your life where you really just said, I wish this day would end. I'm sure no one in this room has ever had a day like that. There are incidents that happen to us. There are moral failings that we might do. That we say, oh my gosh, I just can't wait till this day is over. And what would happen if we were created as creatures that didn't sleep? That day would never end. And, and we'd be confined to that day. We'd be confined to that state of existence forever. So the Rebbe said that Hashem had mercy on us and created us as creatures that need sleep. And again, different people require different, different uh, amounts of time or whatever, but just to that there's a time of day that you go down, and you start fresh. It gives the opportunity for tomorrow. If a person failed today in work or in morals, tomorrow can be different. Tomorrow is going to be better. And so with this, you know, we're, we're here at a, an amazing retreat with amazing lessons and amazing food as well. And everyone comes here for an opportunity to recharge, an opportunity to take in not only spiritually, but physically as well. But it's not something that should end when the retreat ends either. It's something you got to take into tomorrow. The last day of the retreat, you have to say, I'm not leaving all my spiritual attainments behind. I'm bringing this into tomorrow. So any time in our lives that we that we want to change, any, any situations we find ourselves in where I wish things could be different, you have the gift of tomorrow. You have the gift of, that is facilitated by sleep. Thank you very much. So, so a person having a dream about a loved one, perhaps, that, uh, that has passed on, so one of the, we, 
our job is not necessarily to focus on where exactly that dream came from. Our job is to take that almost as a gift. To take it as a gift and to think perhaps how in my waking life can I transfer that, those good feelings, let's say, that I had. Let's say a person dreams about their grandmother that has since gone into the, since gone into the, the next world. And you wake up and it was so real and it felt like almost you were getting a, a, like a visitation. In fact, some people like to call a dream that they had with a loved one a visitation. The, the practical element that we should, the practical element that we should take out of that is how can I, in my waking life, engage and, and put forth some of the things that I had gained from that experience, that I had gained from my grandmother. So let's say I, there were lessons that I learned from my grandmother that I would like to express in the, the, in the waking world. We should see it as a, as a gift, as sort of uh, an opportunity that we uh, can recharge our connection in a way that we don't ordinarily get to do. The question was, as you age, are there, are there differences in the nature of your dreams? And so if, if the dream that a person is having is based on sort of um, expressing the emotions that are going on in their waking life uh, in the dream world, the, the emotional experiences that, let's say, a teenager has and the senior citizen have might be very different. There's a lot of insecurities that, that young people might be facing, uh, a lot of emotions that they're encountering throughout their day, either in school or at work or whatever it is, that if someone is retired, just the nature of their life, their waking life, is a bit different. And so their, the nature of their dreams might reflect that as well. Like I said, in our generation to begin with, we don't have to be overly concerned. One of the things in the gift of tomorrow that we have um, in, in utilizing and interpreting any, of, any negative dream that we might have is to say, okay, well, that was a very challenging dream experience. And so I'm going to add something good in my day today to sort of you know, recalibrate, to, to balance out that, uh, that, that energy and um, you know, get, get that renewed perspective. Uh, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't worry, and we should, we should encourage telling our children not to worry about the, that the nature of their dream, uh, you know, nightmare or whatever, that it's actually going to take place. Thanks so much. Have a great, great retreat.